March 30th meeting of the New Brunswick Historical Association. Uh, Mr. Secretary, if you would kindly note attendance by who's on the screen. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that um, those who have mo notified me of their absence and are therefore excused from tonight's meeting are Tom Struble and Lisa Trulis. <clears throat> So I just wanted to um, open with an announcement. It, it's been requested of me to respond to questions about the meeting schedule of the Historical Association. This association has met once so far in 2023 on January 19th. Um, per the city's legal department, the Historical Association shall meet in accordance with the rules that govern our types of meetings. Considering bandwidth and connection concerns previously encountered, I have now changed the technology and switch the meetings over to a city platform. The login information for each meeting will always be available on the city's website calendar as it was tonight. Um, I will now move to the public portion of the meeting. Uh, Mike, okay. start, excuse me? Oh, I'm just signing in late. Sorry about okay. that. Okay, I'm just moving now to the uh, public portion of the meeting. Michael Droulis, our city administrator, is assisting me with managing the technology while I chair this meeting. If any member of the public wishes to address the Historic Association, please state your full name when the appropriate letter of the alphabet is called. Um, I'm going to do A through um, M and N through Z. Um, members of the public may speak up to three minutes. One time only in this portion of the meeting is limited to 15 minutes. I will ask that the members of the association listen to the public testimony without interruption or response as to assure that the public has their full allotment of time. If there is a matter for discussion, it will be considered through the meeting. Starting with A to, what did I say? A to M, you have three minutes to address the historic association. So do we have anybody uh, whose last name starts with A through M that would like to speak? Yeah, Charlie Craddeville. Can you hear me? Okay. Thank you, Charlie. And uh, N, is that it? A through M? Anyone else? N through Z? Okay, Charlie, the floor is yours. Yes. Good evening, commissioners. It's um, good to finally be with you. I've been trying to track down one of these meetings for uh, a couple months now, and I know. I had gotten a report that folks were not being let into the January meeting, and, and I verified that by trying to join myself and have raised these issues to the city council and to some of you via email. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm concerned about the public access for, um, you know, residents who, who want to follow your work. I, uh, you know, um, you know, I for one care care deeply about the city and its history, and I, I you know thank you for your service. And I'd like to learn more about what you're working on and your priorities, and, yeah. and be able to witness it for myself. And I'm glad that I finally can can do that tonight. And pleased to report that we're actually broadcasting the meeting live on New Brunswick today. So you'll have uh, probably your your biggest audience in a while for a historical association meeting. And I'm I'm glad um, that we can play a part in that. I'm glad that tonight's meeting is open to the public. And I'm just uh, not really clear on what happened because when I had followed up with the city council, got some statements from the city administrator that seemed to suggest that, you know, what was being done was on purpose. The public was not being let in. And I never really got a straight answer or a good explanation for it. And so I would, uh, you know, respectfully ask for the association to respond to my questions here and now, uh, quite simply. You know who made that decision to exclude the public from the January meeting, and then subsequently to cancel the February meeting, and subsequently to reschedule this meeting. And um, you know why haven't why hasn't there been better communication? You know clear communication with the public about uh, when you're meeting and how to how to join. I mean I for one, you know, go to City Hall and you'll see a schedule up there that says you're meeting remotely, but it doesn't say what platform you're meeting on. It doesn't say the meeting ID. It doesn't say the password. Folks have to, you know, search through the New Brunswick City website just to find the calendar, the fourth item on today's calendar, so it doesn't make the top three. So people actually have to click through to the all events just to get to 
you know, the basic information about, about how to join. And so I think we can do a lot better. And I, I hope that someone um, will respond with their honest uh, assessment of what happened in, in January and February and, and, and what brings us here today. And uh, again, I thank you for the opportunity to speak and to witness your work tonight. Okay, thank you, Charlie. Um, um, is there anyone else that would like to speak? Okay. Um, uh, Charlie, the uh, February meeting was canceled because um, the members needed more time to gather some information about their projects, and the March meeting was postponed for COVID reasons. And, oops, and, um, uh, the login information for the meetings is on the city website, top page. All you have to do is go to cityofnewbrunswick.org. The calendar is right on the top page, identified today, and it'll, it'll, be, it'll be listed there on today's events. Click on it, and it gives you all the login information. So thank you um, for your comments. And, and how about and the January meeting? Can, can I get a response January on the January meeting? January meeting happens on uh, January the 19th. And um, um, it was scheduled for January, January 19th and happened on January 19th. And why wasn't I allowed in? I tried to join. Um, I don't believe it was. Um, uh, I was under the impression at the time, it was my understanding that we did not need to have a public meeting. <clears throat> And um, because we are a purely advisory committee and we are not subject to the Open Public Meetings Act. So I think that that was explained to you. I know that this has come up in several meetings. I know you've been in touch with the administrator and legal and whoever else, uh, our PIO, and they've explained that. So I'm not gonna waste time um, going over that again, if you please. We have so much to cover tonight and we have a limited amount of time and we only have six or seven meetings a year. So I'm gonna move on with our agenda at this time. But thank you again and thank you for being here. So let's we'll move on to the cha uh, chair's report. Um, the first thing I wanted to ask the members who are present, Tom Struble has a new job and it's going to, he thinks it's going to prevent him from coming to the meetings on Thursdays. He doesn't know what his schedule will be yet, but he would like to know if it's possible that we could uh, change to another night of the week. Um, for me, that's fine. Is there anybody that would have a problem changing, even though we don't know what day of the week we would change to? I have, I'm pretty committed on Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays from 6 to 7.30, just for, for my daughter's soccer practice. Okay, so no can, Monday, can, Wednesday, or Friday. I mean, I can do it remotely on a phone. It's, I mean, if I can, if we're meeting remotely, it's no problem. It's just if we come back yeah. together. Yeah. So that's just something, okay. I mean, Tuesdays and Thursdays are better for me because I can be home. Okay. But, you know, either way, a phone is fine too. Okay. He's not even sure yet what his schedule will be. So, um, um, so we'll, okay. we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. As soon as we know something, I'll email everybody and, and see what, what works for the next meeting. Okay. I've got classes on uh, Wednesday night at 5.30 to, from 5.30 to 7, so. Okay, so Dinar is no no Wednesday. Yeah, thank you. Okay, we we certainly don't want to do it on a Friday night. So it's Monday through Thursday are our options, and right now Tuesday looks like it would work for everyone if we did that from time to time. Okay. Okay. Um, the next thing I wanted to mention was uh, I know that I had told, and we're going to discuss this a little later when we talk about the results of the survey I sent out. Um, three Mile Run Cemetery. I'm still collecting information and I'll share that all with you by email so that we can discuss at the next meeting. Um, I'm in touch with some of the people who have a connection to that cemetery. So I wanna gather everything and they were, they were discussing grant possibilities. So I, I need to get all my thoughts in order and all the background information together before I present it to um, the association. So that will happen at the next meeting. And then the other thing I wanted to talk about was story.com. I had sent everyone an email this morning. Um, this is a branded app that enables self-guided tours that can be useful for the Historical Association and the Parks and Gardens Commission and, and, and other departments as well. And it has the capability to function like a walking tour app. 
Um, I can invite um, uh, the a sales rep that I spoke to to attend our next meeting and to speak right up front um, so that we can all learn more and she can answer all the questions that you might have after looking over their website and clicking on some of those links. Um, did anybody get a chance to uh, <coughs> click on anything or to read about story.com? Okay, so you have a little time to do that. And um, uh, what do you all think about inviting her to the next meeting or if it's convenient for her or the one after? Sounds good? Yeah, yeah. I'm all for it. I checked it out. I think it looks really good. It's just the, the yeah. require I thought so too. sponsoring. Okay, cool. Yeah. And I, I uh, was impressed with the uh, website uh, examples of um, uh, agencies that they've uh, covered. Uh, they certainly seem to have the expertise. So I think it's yeah. worth exploring. And of course, the key question is uh, cost. Cost. Yeah. Each of those municipalities did different things with it. So, um, and I think that the one in Morgan City, Louisiana, I think they actually, they're the ones that actually did the walking tour. So this could check off a few of our boxes, uh, you know, uh, 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 histor a city historical sites brochure, a walking tour, and whatever else, you know, an online museum. So this could really be helpful to the city in a, in a number of ways um, and can check all those boxes. So we'll see, we'll see how everybody feels after hearing uh, Ms. Ms. Uh, what is her name? I think it was Ms. Gallagher um, explain it and after you get a chance to play with um, with some of those tours that are listed on, on uh, in my email. Um, okay, so from here, let's go. Uh, those are those are my um, announcements and, um, and uh, discussion points. From here, let's go to our vice chair's report. Uh, nothing significant to report at this time, uh, except that uh, the gardens at uh, Buckle Mansion are in the planning stage for uh, opening, and um, I'll have more to say about that at the next uh, meeting. Do you know who's, and, who's uh, doing that? Well, right now, Mary Beth's taking the lead, but I know she's talking with you, Susan, Yes. Uh, because she's being called to do uh, a number of other things and uh, right. she needs to release some of the um, time constraints that she was I understand. Uh, dealing with. So uh, anything you can do to help would be greatly appreciated. Right. I uh, hope she, I would meet with her early next week and, um, and discuss what's happening there and, and maybe we'll loop Sal into the discussion as well. That's great. That's okay. great. Then we can and figure can out. Go what to the same uh, bar I was just at tonight, and we can just pick up where we left off. I'm sorry. I said we can meet at the same bar where I was at tonight, <laughs> and we can pick where off, were you tonight? Uh, from there. <laughs> I can't tell you. You give me the name, I'll be there. Okay. Okay. Um, anything else? That's it. Okay. City Historians Report. George, are you with us? Doesn't look like it. No, it doesn't. And I didn't hear from him. So uh, hopefully it's just a technological thing and he's and we'll see him at some point during this meeting. So let's let's put that on hold and we'll go on to um, our uh, ongoing and unfinished business. I know every time we, we hit this part of the meeting, we ask Brian about geocaches. So you can just give us your your um, summary of what's going on, if anything, at this point. It's still yeah, winter, right. actually. Yeah, yeah. So activity's been low, but so we have uh, just some statistics. Like I think the app that we're talking about on Story will kind of cover the same things, although it's not a, a real treasure hunt. So we have uh, the Alice Archibald Jenning uh, Park with the mural um, that my friend um, Bob Aaron did. That has thirty eight finds. Um, oh, just this, oh. this year, so that's good, uh, since the new year. The A-Frame Bridge Tenders House, which is right in front of my house, Landing Lane Bridge, has 77 fines. What, in January? Yeah, and then um, Old Hale Street School 
has 37. There was like a gathering or like some festival, a geocaching event that happened in um, East Jersey, Old Town. So that brought a lot of people from far places and they hit all of the New Brunswick geocaches all at once. Um, and then I'm still waiting on Columbia Hall just for the construction to finish up over there. And right, then right. our most popular one, I think because it's close to the Hyatt, uh, was the third declaration of Colonel Hamilton Jr.'s grave. Um, that has been disabled because the, geo the, the, the container itself went missing. I replaced it, it went missing again. I replaced it and I, after 30 days, if it's not there, the geocaching board of governors or whomever they are um, <laughs> disables the cache. So I'll, I'll make a new one with a better, I think someone just misunderstands you. You're not supposed to actually take the thing. You take the stuff out of, the, it was a little magnetic hide key box that kept vanishing. So. Uh, that's that. I mean, it's still getting good traffic. I still got a lot of positive emails from people that appreciate the history and, you know, just find the stuff out there with their family. They're yeah. visiting mostly, um, you know, for whatever conferences, Model UN um, in the spring brings a lot of like, you know, teenage kids around that'll grab some geocaches and stuff. And I'm, you know, still, uh, I'll go and I'll do some maintenance uh, over the next, as it warms up a little bit and just refresh all the, the logs and the keys and everything. But or the key boxes. But yeah, that's all from the geocaching side. Well, good job because you you know all those hits from Jan since January. I didn't expect there to be even that many hits in January, February, and March. So yeah, I mean, I think the lack of snow might have helped a bit too because stuff yeah, was not yeah. buried and covered and easy access and nothing going on. So uh, regardless of what happens with a city tour or an app for a walking tour. I think the geocaching should always be in place because it's just, you know, it has that treasure hunt um, feel to it, and yeah, which is yeah. exciting. So yeah, I, I'm, sure. I'm so glad that we engaged in this through you. So thank you. Sure. Um, I know that uh, each time we talk about unfinished business, we also talk about Willow Grove Cemetery and cleanups, but I have a feeling that that kind of fizzled out, and maybe we should be removing this now from from our agenda. Bob, do you have any um, input I, here? I I have not heard anything from the Rotary Club. Uh, there, the point person, I think, on their cleanup. I just found out recently is moving out of state, so I would not be surprised if it goes into hiatus. Right. And I think that Raf is Raphael on? I think that Raphael is, is working in New York and I'm not sure that he has, he's teaching at Middlesex County College and has a class that will come and do that again this year. So right now, let's put that, uh, let's put that on temporary hold and see um, if it comes back up. But, um, but it's not well, going I'll, to be. I'll just add to that too. I think it can happen a lot less frequently after we did it like a couple consecutive weekends for like three or four weekends and just got the stuff that had piled up after many years kind of out of the way. And if we're in there just like quarterly, like every three months, just do a, a, a okay. walkthrough. Um, it doesn't have to, ha it just needs to be, you know, it's easier to maintain things than to repair them. So it's like, if we just maintain and instead of ignore it for, for many years and let stuff pile up if, if we just make it kind of a tradition a seasonal tradition or some some date where it's a and it can be an all like the if the three mile run cemetery gets involved too it can be kind of uh, an event maybe we talk to heather fennec or something to organize with her people as well because there is watershed okay. the lyle brook is right there and it's all related so that sounds great thank you for that um natalie Last time we met, we talked about um, uh, wayfinding signs that had been installed in Franklin Township, and you were going to ask the county people uh, about those on our behalf. And then there was also some talk on Route, uh, on Route 18 about the Brown Historic Sign for the Low House, and if there was any possibility that we could get one for the Buckaloo Mansion, All something right. similar. Yeah, I had talked to like the, the cultural and heritage and the arts institute people, uh -huh. um, because that some of that stuff is not on a county road. The county's like, well, realistically, like Buckaloo Mansion and all that, the city should be paying 
for those signs. Um, it wouldn't come under like a county responsibility. So, do you know who paid for the the Cornelius Low House sign? Well, the Cornelius Low House is on is on a county park. Oh, okay. So you know, I see. Okay, down and all that <clears throat> is county property. So right. that's why they did the signs. Now I know that you could probably, you know, talk to them and, you know, there can be a charge between New Brunswick and the county. Um, you know, we certainly, I know we have a sign, you know, section. You, you know, works. so with the sign, if the sign is out on Route 18, that's actually state property, right? That's state property. And that, I know you'd have to go to the state to get permission to put it there. <clears throat> so where would we put a, 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 one of those brown um, signs that that says historic? What does the, the Cornelius Low House, it says uh, coming up or on the right, or does it have a directional on it? Or what does it I don't say? Think, no, I don't think it does. I think they just, you know, sometimes they put something on those big green signs, you know, that are actually like on 287 where you'll, you'll see an historical sign after that saying it's just at that exit. And then I, it's almost like a wayfinding, like we yeah, did yeah. where there's, um, because I worked on the wayfinding way when city center did that. Um, you know, first there's just one directional and then it goes, you know, as you get closer. Um, so the county, you know, they said they would help us you know, that the Art Institute said that they'd be willing to help us with it. But realistically, since it was sitting on city property, especially Buckaloo Mansion, that it right. would have to be funded by through the city. Well, where would we put a, a marker? Right at the exit there on Route 18 that comes up onto George Street or onto College? Uh, is it George Street? Yeah, I think that's a George Street exit, right? Yeah. I have to... Well, I know, remember I told you that wh what we went through, that they literally, like, took down, the this, this state goes crazy when you do anything with, the, with a sign on state property. Um, it takes years, and, you know, if it gets, it's got to be a breakaway pole, and we right. went through a nightmare with the, with the wayfinding, where we actually had to put like we wanted the wayfinding out on Route 18, and they actually would not even allow that. Um, we had to get it like off the exit, and for new for new, and that's where. And it was at the bottom there, and then it got knocked down again when they started putting up those apartments and stuff. They took it yeah. down. So it's not an easy process to get something on 18. But right. if there's something, say, like River Road, where it's it's going towards Landing Lane, um, or on George Street, like once you come off, uh, possibly on Easton Avenue, you know, further mm -hmm. up, if you're directing it towards the park. Um, right. So, you know, you want it, like, in an area, and then you would have, it like, another directional saying like turn here to go um to go up to the park if you're doing it off of off of river right i right. i'll leave that sometimes when i'm leaving work and go that way <clears throat> so um but some of it we if any of it turns out to be a county road you know i mean like i said i'm sure the county doesn't mind making the sign but new brunswick would probably have to pay for and then right. Well, you know what? Let me talk to um, engineering and okay. find out about breakaway signs and where we can install them on city property because it sounds like if we go to county or state property, it'll be a nightmare and a long time. So well, county would be more would be better about it, but the state forget Route Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the okay. state. Then they O T, and then it's a study, and it it's like crazy. Um, and it. Like, it's got to be a certain stand, like a certain pole that if it gets hit, it's going to break away, that it doesn't, 
become a project. I mean, it's unbelievable. Um, right. It's a little easier on local roads than it is anything on a state highway. And also, right. oh, if that's, I didn't, I don't remember the off the agenda. It happened, remember when we were talking about the, um, that was another thing I was going to find out about. City Center did make six um, of the QR codes that we're using for something. Um, and I had no idea how really expensive it was. It, it, it was like over $300 for just six of them. And they're, the size is about six by six. And then with something next to it, because of the, it's a, you know, just making the QR code and there's only like a couple companies that do it. And right. then it's special glue. So I find there that's pretty expensive. So so this so we've moved on now to talking about putting QR codes on our his, on our existing right. historical markers. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I that was so that was three hundred bucks for six of them, and we've got like thirty historical markers. I know. I I had no idea, and you know, Pam Stefanik, you know Pam, had yeah, explained. She's like. It's a really special kind of look because you don't want it sticking. Like you want it to stick in and hold up to weather, but you don't want it to adhere so much that like you have to sandblast, you know, love sandblast it off or, or do a heavy scrape. So right. it, it's something that wouldn't, it's a glue that won't ruin the structure that it's on, but it has to be strong enough and she goes, it's really like the glue and the coating on the QR code so it stands up to weather and creating the QR code itself. So, that, you know, each one has to be unique, obviously. I just didn't, like, who knew till you start finding out about this stuff? Because I, yeah. you know, I started calling around to everybody and I'm like, well, what about this or what about that? And they're like, well, we haven't really used that. And and then I happened to walk in to sit into city center and they were on the desk. And I said, I said, by the way, how much were these? And she goes, Oh, six of them were like just under $400. I went, what? And that's how I found out the whole background. Of right. So, and then they, they wouldn't even be placed. I mean, if somebody's standing in front of a historical marker and they're reading the text, they wouldn't necessarily know that there's a QR code attached to the back of the sign. And we don't even know that the backs of these signs are even accessible to the reader. Right. Right. So either, and by the way, the ones that she had were fairly large. Like they were like six inches high, you know, by this. Yeah. And you still have to kind of say what that QR code is doing. So there has right. to be some some writing like she there was writing to the right of it explaining what it was you know like so you would have to say um click on historical marker for information you know um so it's a little it, it's not i mean it, in theory it sounds like a great idea but who knew you know find out something new every day that there's special glue and yeah so I don't know. How do you all think we should proceed with that? With with. I mean, we can find out if there's a smaller QR code. Obviously, like I said, what she had was larger, was for something very specific. But you know, and we might be able to. Um, I can call. I didn't call that company because I'm I'm in the middle of a major project at the camp. So, um, I've been like super busy like even working on Saturdays bringing home my laptop yeah. so I haven't had um, a chance to really go further with some of that the, the thing that it seems that, like it, oh, go ahead. no go ahead I, I think that seems like there might be some overlap with what the uh, story app offers and so maybe we check yeah. out the story app yeah. first and then yeah, so it's just not so redundant too. for no reason yeah. Yeah, because I mean, even if we if we found something or seeing if there's a kind of grant, which I think that they said there, is, oh, there's a grant coming up, um, that would be would be available to us. That's what the Art Institute 
um, they would have one like in the fall and in the spring. So we could possibly get some funding for that. Uh, it's a grant that they wanted to get out sooner, but it like it was partially because of COVID and now that's opening up. So there is a possible revenue stream also for, uh, to for get a some. QR code project or for the, no, for the story like app? For that historical thing. For the, the story for, app. For the story app, yeah. Oh, that would be wonderful. Yeah. Okay. So let's let's ask uh, the representative to join us at our next meeting, so yeah. that so that we have a couple of weeks to to really learn about it. We'll listen to her, and then we'll we'll see how that how we can plug some of this stuff into it. Yeah, and I'll reach back out to the county person. They were going to send me. I think I sent some of it to you, Sue. But well, to send me the links for those grants, I have to keep checking them to see when that grant becomes available. Okay. I yep. think keep, keep, the county keep me in the loop. Because it's for towns to use. So. I, I just missed what you said because it got a little choppy. Sorry. I they there's you can I think it's right on the county website, but there she gave me a better link. Okay. To keep checking when that grant comes up. Okay. Um, and she's like, you know, get a plan together, which means, you know, if we have this group or this story thing, um, we could say, you know, we, we're engaged with this story thing. This is what we want to do. And you need the funding to, you know. So it that sounds was, really was wonderful. To talk to the story people before we apply for the grant okay. anyway. Okay. I'll loop, I'll loop her in. Uh, I'll give her a call tomorrow and loop her in. Great. Um, and I'll also touch base with Tom Struel because I would want him to be at that meeting. Okay. Um, so he's finding out tonight what his schedule might be uh, moving forward. Um, so th this also, Brian, the next thing I wanted to talk about was historical indicators on Google and Apple Maps for the Buckaloo Mansion we had talked about. Sorry, I'm eating too. <laughs> well, I'm trying not to. Oh, that's okay. And, um, so, so this would also be. I saw, I saw some of the maps on Story.com that had all the pins all over the place, and um, but yeah, so historical I indicators on Google and Apple Maps is a little bit different. And and uh, has anything been done to to figure out how we can add those? Yeah, so Google's very cool, and you can just, there's a drop-down menu that allows you to add missing places, and you can add it yourself and give a link. There's So the deal that I found out with Bucklew is that if you click on Bucklew Park, it takes you to the park, but it doesn't show that there's a historical uh, museum there or a building, mansion, anything like that. But if you scroll down, once you go there, there's other links that you can click on that says the museum at Bucklew Mansion. It's it's maintained by uh, the, the Daughters Army. of the American Revolution. Yeah. Um, so once you do that, you can then see where the actual pin is for the mansion. But it's two steps. It's not like if you're just on Google right. Maps, you see right. it initially. You have to click on the park and then scroll down and see. And it's got nice photos and everything in there. They're embedded. Um, but what I, I submitted, and Google's going to get back to me, at some point uh, to just to have it as the first time view, like a, a pin that's always there as soon as you open Google Maps, like St. Peter's Hospital is there as soon as you open it, because it's a hospital and you shouldn't have to click on a place to find the hospital. So I wanted to have the same kind of first right. touch. Right. But oh, question, oh, yeah, go ahead. Um, are you, a, how far away do structures, like can you have two pins in the same place or does there need to be some distance between them? So, because the mansion is inside the park, so can we have two pins geographically in the same place? Yeah, well, I think that's the the nesting nature of it is that because the the mansion's in the park, the park shows up first, and the because yeah. the mansion's inside of it, it comes secondarily when you click on it. So that I, the proximity normally doesn't matter, but because it's within the park, I think that's why it gets that kind of uh, secondary status in terms of clicks. All right, so can we, can we establish a new pin for it? That's what I'm waiting on. I, I submitted oh, all the okay. stuff for it. 
and I put it under, instead of putting under, um, like you, you can claim the location, I just put it under um, New Brunswick Parks and Recreation and hopefully um, that's enough. I mean, there's, it's pretty simple and, and they just have to get back to me. They said it would be, you know, within two weeks I should know and this was about eight days ago. So hopefully we'll get something on that. Okay. okay. All right, cool. Okay, so let's move on to new business. Um, so we had talked about having three projects for the year, a large project and two smaller ones. But I, I can see from the results of the survey that I had sent to you all that that our larger, everybody thought that the city historian interview should be of utmost importance at this point. Um, but then the Joyce Kilmer House virtual tour kind of gets wrapped into that. Um, so I don't know if, if we want to plan to have the interview with uh, Mr. Dawson um, on the website and have the Joyce Kilmer House virtual tour be part of it, or if it should be a separate thing. So they came out in our survey as number one and number two. Um, separately, they're both they're both large projects. Together, it's one massive project. So I don't know. I'm going to throw it out there and and see what you all think. Or do you want to hear? Do you want to hear the order of all all of the other projects and where they? Yeah. Okay, so City of Starring interview came out top. Next was the Joyce Kilmer House virtual tour. Uh, next was a walking tour of historical New Brunswick with an app or integrated into our website. Uh, next was a virtual museum of New Brunswick history uh, with pictures and videos um, to be separated out from the photo gallery on our website and, and make a distinct section for our virtual museum. Um, and fifth, was uh, the uh, Raritan River, River Festival participation in tabling. Um, but, you know, with, with, with that, oh, let, me take, let me finish. Uh, and, and sixth was a three mile run cemetery. So, so nobody thought we should be focusing on that before we focus on all of these other things. But one thing I wanted to say about tabling um, the way we used to do it um, is that that may be uh, more of an outdated method of communicating our, our information. Um, and those papers and the flyers and the things that were used to be given out at a table at a festival, most times now end up on the ground. So, you know, if we have the software, we have the technology to do, um, you know, a walking tour, we can very easily set up QR codes or ways of accessing the information on one's phone or on one's uh, computer when they get home or there have to be other means of communicating our information than paper flyers. Uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, no, I know um, the county because, uh, you know, I am a little bit involved with, you know, Middlesex Bay the county doesn't even want brochures. They only right. have QR codes on each table um, for you to access, right. you know, and I'm go saying. right to the health department because they they said it, it's just become a way, it's really a waste it's of a paper. Waste. Right. Um, so either you just create like one QR code on a board that you can bring for tabling purposes and then a lot of times, like we have pro like some promo stuff. Um, so I, I guess I have a drive program that that's part of a grant that I do for public safety. Um, besides my, that's the project I'm working on. That's beside, that has nothing to do with the health department and the work that I do there. So, um, you know, we had they get, they created QR codes for us last year for Middlesex Day, and then people could click on it and find out about it. Besides us telling them, you know, so I I mean that's that's just something to consider is just creating a QR code, having it on a board that you can bring, and maybe um, 
you know, doing a little promotional thing or whatever, but. Right. Yeah, um, I, think that, I think that we need to think differently about how we um, give out information and, and you know, the, what we did last year with the, um, the, uh, the vessel, uh, the mm -hmm. Rutgers vessel and, and tours on the water and with a little bit of a, a lecture about how New Brunswick came to be and, and how commerce uh, developed the area. Um, I think that's a much better method of introducing people to the history of New Brunswick. Um, and we have the option of doing that this year as well. Yeah. You know, I was going to add to real quick, like tabling, uh, it, it's like we have a few docents or one of us or three of us that are knowledgeable and there's some artifacts that are from and of New Brunswick. Like I know Jen O'Neill has a whole collection in her house of like New Brunswick clay jugs, J and J right, stuff, right. anything like that that just, or it could be a musket or something, or the the, or the musket ball, whatever, that just sparks a conversation with some knowledgeable, it could be grad students or whomever, uh, to just talk to people about the history here, and then the boat, and in addition to the boat, like I think 3D objects with real conversation might be uh, a nice table to have at that the river. That is nice. And, and Bob, Bob Belvin has a wealth of information and artifacts in the basement of the of the uh, library. True, true. <laughs> I'm not sure how exciting some of them are, but uh, I'm sure yeah. there's some exciting stuff there. Well, you have to sell it, Bob. You got to get people riled up about. That's right. <laughs> library books. Oh, the books are easy. It's no, it's it's the, it's the artifacts. It's the other yeah. stuff that that he hides in the basement. <laughs> Until we have a city museum. Well, it's be better than them ending up in the in the dumpster. I mean, like the East Jersey Old Town had that little print set up at the Heart Festival that was downtown. Like they had a printmaking, old-fashioned printmaking, something like you know, artifacts, three D objects, yeah, analog, yeah. all that. Um, in addition to whatever tech, but I think that's you know that's kind of the way to go. So let's go back to um, to the prioritized activity, which was the city historian interview. So there are a, a definite parts of this project. We need to formulate questions. We need to interview George Dawson. We need to edit that interview. And then we need to create uh, a YouTube presentation and attach it to our website. So I think that there's something for everybody in that project. Um, I wish Raphael was on, uh, was here tonight because he, he will record it. He will video it. Um, but what I'd like to do is, um, at least formulate the questions. So I don't know how we want to do that or who's interested in doing that, or, or if you all want to put together, um, 10 questions that you might find fascinating. You don't need to have the answers to them, but 10 questions that you have about the history of New Brunswick, um, would you write them and send them to me and I'll coordinate them. And then we can talk about which ones we actually want to um, include in the interview. So that would be kind of fun. I mean, even I have some uh, questions about old New Brunswick. Um, well, and I think you can actually pose that as as the, you know, t 10 questions for our historian and literally right. just have it. And then re realistically, you know, we can, that can be updated. You know, right. we can have a segment where, where George is answering a question and then maybe if it, he can, re we can do, have him answer 20 questions and put up different videos of what you might be interested in. Um, because he's a, Mr. we know you're a wealth of knowledge, George. So, you know, maybe we can, uh, and do it as kind of as a series and then update it so that when you go on the historical society, there, it would be something new. We could change it every quarter or every six months and, you know, to right. and 
and and call it ten questions or five questions with our historian, right? And, you know, present it that way. The thought. Okay. So so in the next week or so, would you all send me ten questions that you have about the history of New Brunswick? It'd be interesting to see if if some of us have the same questions. Sure. And and then I'll send I'll, I'll compile it and send it back out to everybody. And uh, and we'll decide what what we would ask George, and we'll get George's input too on what's Im what's important to talk about, and Bob Belvin's input as well as our library director, and um, and then we'll we'll move forward from there. So we'll have a task before each meeting, and and hopefully by the by the fall we would have something in place, something finished and in place. Any good objection? strategy. Yep. No, that's good. Okay, so so then let me talk about uh, a little bit about some of the suggestions that you all had at the bottom of your surveys for um, for other projects. And one thing that three people said was that why why don't we highlight and talk about our more recent history, maybe the last hundred to hundred and fifty years. Uh, most of our focus has been on the far past and the Revolutionary War and how New Brunswick came to be. Um, but there are things in New Brunswick's history in the last hundred years that are also significant. And maybe we should be talking about those as well. And two people mentioned the historical music scene in New Brunswick. So what oh. can we do with that, Brian? <laughs> um, I, wish, I mean, the, the story app, would definitely include the melody and the Roxy and that other crazy bar that you knew. Yeah. JP Stevens or whatever. It wasn't called JP Stevens, but that's a school. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, all that's there. I, and melody, I'm interested. Roxy, Patrick's. There was Patrick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm also interested in like the immigrant population and the, the change. Oaxacans, I worked really closely and I played in a Mexican soccer league for years. Uh, and I know some people that have been here for 30 plus years from Oaxaca that are part of the fabric of the city. There's Hungarian history that, you know, we're always right. on colonial things. And so and then African-American history as well. I think there's underground railroad stuff still that needs to be um, pulled up and, you know, just uh, any of that more recent, yeah, post-industrialization yeah. uh, history. And then, and then, yeah, and then, you know, coming out of the 70s and 80s, the, the, the highways and uh, Route 18, all that. Not there's not always beautiful history, but there's stuff, stuff to explore. Right, it's significant stuff that that helped New Brunswick grow and thrive. Yeah. Okay. So it sounds like a lot of what we want to do may hinge on the story app because that may solve more than one one problem. That would be interesting. Opposed to a virtual tour of the George Kramer House. I'm sorry? To actual tours. It's a physical building. It is here yeah. in the city. You don't have to do a, a, a video of it. You could go up and get an actual tour. At Poland's Doll Ride. Yeah, well, we do have actual tours, right, George? We should put it out. In a further announcement that the, you can get an actual tour by uh, calling the dollar ride and they would set it up with me. I live in the Brunswick, that's down the street. And I could come down and give a tour. You know, I can, we could actually put that on the city website um, in, in the uh, notification window that comes up on the lower right side, uh, information about historical tour inside the Joyce Comer House. So, um, are there certain times of the year that you would prefer to do those tours or? Any time. Uh, sometimes I travel, uh, uh, not, not in the city, but. Uh, yeah. And people, uh, the dial a ride um, office is where they would call to set that up or would they call you directly? They call me directly. The head of the office, Melissa, Calls me directly. And, Say that again, please. And uh, uh, if we're still on 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 uh, 
COVID uh, policy uh, uh, I've eliminated to uh, uh, five people at a time. Okay. The only other thing I had um, from the last meeting, and Bob Slifka, maybe you can help me remember, we, uh, the DAR to market the mansion, what was that about? Well, I think uh, Brian kind of hit on it when he uh, mentioned that uh, the mansion uh, needs to be highlighted on uh, Google or other okay. uh, search engines. Okay. okay. Uh, the only other uh, agenda item, uh, Susan, that I uh, wasn't sure we dealt with was uh, Macro Merle. Oh, yeah. But I put that on hold because George wasn't here yet. So we can okay. go back to that. So. Um, the Mackle mural return progress from, from the proprietary house. I don't believe that there's been any, any change and that the proprietary house, although, um, three years ago, they tried to sell that mural. Um, um, they seem reluctant to give it up now. So I'm not exactly sure how difficult it would be to get it back or if we, we don't want to push it. But if they're looking to get rid of it, we want to be the recipient because we are the owners of it. So in 2001 or 2002, we loaned it to the proprietary house through DEVCO. And when they don't want it there anymore, then it should come back to us. It's not, shouldn't be for sale. Right, and uh, that is before them, I've had a uh, number of discussions with it with uh, uh, the Harry House uh, members, uh, including board members, and mostly with Lisa. And uh, uh, they're involved in, a, of course, a, an enormous project restoration of the proprietary house, which is uh, part of the uh, state park system uh, and is listed and described by them as the last. Uh, 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 edifice of, of British rule uh, in the colonies. By some of them, they mean the North American colonies and rebellions, since they still have uh, British rule uh, structures in Canada. Uh, right. Yeah. So they're involved in, in this major project. The uh, 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 and William, William Franklin can be part of that. Because uh, uh, he lived there for two year, uh, three years, uh, and um, uh, and that is why really why the uh, Priority House is very a very important uh, building, uh, and the uh, Mackel, uh, McGill Mackel display, which is mounted in their one of their rooms there. Uh, uh, is a uh, statement by a uh, regional artist of some repute after some study of the importance of William Franklin, and uh, uh, and it's it's an issue before them, and uh, things uh, things move very s slowly. I don't want this to uh, get into a fight between New Brunswick and Perth Amboy. Oh, no, and no, no. Work together, work together and, and the, the projects they're involved in should uh, help each other. Yeah, I agree. But th when I was there four years ago, she they were very intent on, on releasing it. They wanted to get rid of it. They didn't want it in their foyer anymore. And um, uh, they actually wanted to sell it to uh, the Rutgers to, Rutgers. to right. raise, some, uh, raise some money. Uh, right. And uh, 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 now they're uh, washed with money, and uh, 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 and I understand that uh, uh, Christopher uh, Christopher Palladino is 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 interested in work, working with them and has been in touch with them, and uh, and uh, he has uh, uh, he's he, 
it's hopeful it'll be available for a, for a large large donation. But they get millions of do dollars in the, st the state budget. And uh, Assembly Speaker uh, Rogelin, who is their local assemblyman, uh, says it's another Williamsburg. Uh, maybe it's not another Williamsburg, but it's uh, like a, like another Williamsburg Center. This is a uh, a uh, an important structure from the colonial period, which is uh, being restored as the period uh, in the 1770s. Okay, but do we know that if they want to keep the mural now, have they decided no, they want to no. hang on to it? No, this uh, uh, the uh, uh, this, this will support what they're doing. That uh, uh, we uh, uh, use uh, McGill's uh, findings as a, for the display, Mackel's findings, McGill Mackel's findings, and he made a certain study when he was do, asked the commission to do the murals. He made a a certain study, and he assumed that William Franklin was very important, uh, and nobody, he was the first person to make that claim, actually, uh, since uh, independence, actually. Uh, William Franklin is, was a loyalist, and uh, the uh, uh, argument in people living in, in, in America was that loyalists were not that important. Uh, that's changing, and uh, so uh, the the uh, uh, the Mackel's portrait. Now he wasn't around when uh, uh, Franklin was living. Uh, it's mostly, it's a portrait of how he appeared uh, in uh, seventeen sixty three when he seventeen sixty six when he. Uh, it brought the charter uh, from King George to uh, 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 New Jersey. He was the royal governor. He presented it to the trustees of uh, uh, of uh, Queen's College, uh, and then that charter was lost apparently. So he did it a second time in the 1970 uh, uh, 1770 charter. There was two charters. Uh, and he made a presumably made another presentation to Queens College trustees. Uh, uh, so it's uh, a very attractive uh, uh, panel to have displayed in New Brunswick, and it will be at the uh, according to uh, uh, Chris's decision, uh, it will be displayed at the. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so just so I understand, is this something that the board is studying, or is it something that uh, they? Hopefully, have... the board is still studying. I don't know how much. Uh, 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 hopefully, the board is. Still, I've attended. As several board meetings, and I, uh, uh, in addition to uh, the letters I've written to Lisa, uh, my and, question uh, is: it's Have a, they decided uh, to keep the mural? What? My question is: no, they Have they, they decided to keep it? They don't want to keep it. I'm sorry. Actually, they don't want to keep it. Maybe because it was a, a description of him when he was no before he was living there. Uh, he was only living there at seventy-five to 70, 76 for two years. Uh, Seventy-four, I think. I think three years. Uh, that's not an issue with them. Okay, so I'll touch base with Chris Palladino about 
what he knows and and uh, he was talking a couple of years ago about how we would get it back to New Brunswick. So let me touch base with Chris and see if he what he knows and what his feeling is on this, because they were instrumental in getting it to the proprietary. <laughs> and um, and I think the agreement, the written agreement was that we would get it back when they didn't want it anymore. So well, I'll check up on that from the DEFCO side of things. So that's it. Um, is there anything else that, that, that we need to uh, talk about? Uh, Paladino would would, would uh, remove it and take it back, bring it back. Oh well, we'll check with him. So what? Okay. Are there any other? Um, Bob Flipka. One. Uh, yeah, I just want to. Uh, I just want to support uh, the recommendation that you made, Susan, for uh, members to submit questions for George's interview. Um, yeah. I think that's an excellent. Um, a way of uh, focusing on the content of those interviews. I also think that um, the suggestion, and Brian supported this, that we look at more than just the Revolutionary War or pre-Revolutionary War history of New Brunswick, but move it to more contemporary issues, including things as simple as the Joyce Kilmer House or uh, James Johnson uh, of, uh, right. you know, of, Charleston fame. Uh, and by the way, I still plan a presentation when we meet as a group uh, based on the research I did uh, on that, um, that individual. Uh, the other thing I would support is the notion that our questions might not be the same as those that George, as someone who's looked at the history of New Brunswick for, right. Right. I don't know, George, 10 years, 20 years, whatever, <laughs> might ask. Uh, I think I think yeah. I think your suggestion, Susan, that we consider his input uh, is an excellent Absolutely. one. Absolutely. So, so the ten questions that George submits are going to be really interesting, um, and will be uh, absolutely considered. But it would be interesting to see how what, what questions everybody else asks, and if they're similar yep. to the ones George thinks are the most important. The things of a of a more recent history. I thought, you know, when we were walking around Willow Grove Cemetery one day, we were talking about about doing this project, and we thought that it would be fun to have both he and Bob Belvin in this interview, and we can splice together some stuff. And Bob might be really good at answering a lot of the more recent history questions. Yeah. Well, yeah, because he's got all that information at his fingertips. He's our. What, he's was, the, what was the most newsworthy story in New Brunswick? Excuse me. What was the most newsworthy story in New Brunswick? I don't know if you if you ask today, everybody's talking about Hall's Mill, Hall Mills. Right? Well, it is the, the Hall Mills double double homicide uh, issue. Uh, which the uh, uh, number of New York papers, as well as the home news, covered in, in great depth. And right. uh, uh, the Daily News apparently had a story uh, which uh, the uh, female reporter, Amy, uh, uh, Amy somebody, uh, I think was a, uh, a model for the Brenda Starr uh, uh, comic strip came, which came out in the 30s, uh, since uh, the uh, uh, managing editor of the paper called her uh, uh, a, a star reporter, and she specialized in uh, uh, murders within right. 50 miles of New Brunswick, or maybe even further. You know, she, wow. Uh, the Daily That's News uh, got started with. Uh, that type of coverage and uh, 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 19, 19, uh, 19, uh, 19. It, came, it was the first issue was the Daily, New York Daily News, which the uh, murders occurred in 1922. Uh, and I'm interested in doing a, uh, a, uh, a driving and walking tour of the murder. Uh, uh, which uh, 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 was 
probably formed on George Street in New Brunswick. And well, didn't, 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 didn't uh, somebody just do a walking tour two or three years ago of the murder and this? Well, Mary Hartman did, did the Dean of Douglas, did a uh, tremendous talk on uh, Halls Mills uh, uh, back in the 1980s, I think, after when, when she was the Dean. Uh, right. uh, and she was interested in that she opened the her house, which was the uh, uh, Stevens Mansion, uh, 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 Edward Hall was married to uh, uh, Francis Stevens. Uh, 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 and and she, they lived, she, they lived, she lived on the, the street, what, what street that does, not, not, Grove, not Grove Avenue, but the street before that. Uh, uh, and it's it's now the uh, uh, was a much much after the trial it was required by, by Douglas as the dean's house, and the uh, she actually uh, uh, Miss Hartman actually allowed tours of the house after her talk. I didn't go on the tour, but I attended her talk. Which was, <laughs> well, uh, now there's a sign in front of the house that says, "Please don't trespass." What? Uh, <laughs> yeah. A, an interesting sidelight for those of you who know Carolyn Kotha, Connie's uh, wife. She was brought up in the house next door to the, what is the Dean's house and now the, the uh, Hall Mansion. Uh, because and, and Brian knows, of course, that the uh, there was an amazing discovery by uh, uh, a, a library, the archivist, Kim Adams, of a few thousand pages of missing records of the uh, uh, 2022 uh, uh, and 26, the trial was in 1926 interviews, uh, and the grand jury proceedings, uh, which was not available to anybody else who was doing stories on Paul's Mills. Not available to William Consular since he used a lot of police records, but these records were not missing, were, were not available uh, through the uh, uh, county prosecutor. Uh, and they thought it was, it was destroyed or stolen, but actually were held by a lawyer and turned over to a, a city resident, George Wilson, uh, uh, who lived. Uh, uh, in the fifth ward, I guess, then at Harvard, uh, when he was down downsizing his office, and he had us in his office, and uh, uh, and he put it in a box in his basement, and uh, much later he invited uh, the Brunswick Library and uh, uh, the Rutgers Archives to look at what he had to see if there was any interest in there. Uh, 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 and uh, and this is in, in Pompeo's book, which uh, Brian would know. Uh, that uh, uh, Kim uh, said, "What's in the box in the basement?" And Wilson did never never looked at it. Uh, and maybe he's still, I think he's still alive. Uh, and he uh, had three thousand pages of uh, uh, police and the court records on the Halls Mills proceeding. Uh, uh, so uh, it's a real, and it's in the basement of the, of the uh, uh, Rutgers Library, uh, the archives section, uh, okay. which uh, I think Brian mentioned before. Thank it's, you, it's, George. Um, I've always been fascinated by the Hall Mills case. And, um, and again, uh, this would be a, a wonderful little walking tour to add to our story.com uh, library. So uh, we'll talk about that after- The Ryan Smith's house might be involved in too. Okay. Um, I wanna thank Michael Julis for making this technology possible for me tonight. I don't know if he's still on, but if you are, Michael, thank you so much. I wanna thank everybody for a wonderful meeting. And if there's nothing else, do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. I'll second. Second. Good night, everybody. Thank you so much. Good night. Thank you. Good night.
Good night, George. Night. Thank you. Night. Good night. Thank you.